The job of the blender is to combine these elements in such a way as to produce an overall flavor. A wider repertoire of different beverages than ever before. I think one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia. Single malts, blends, grain whiskies, bourbons and more. If you want my style to be sold around the world, then unfortunately you're going to have to make a compromise. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Tara Nuren is the official historian of the Pink Boots Society, an organisation created in 2008 to assist, inspire and encourage women working in the beer industry. Tara's new book, A Woman's Place is in the Brew House, celebrates the contributions and influence of female brewers and explores the forces that have erased them from the brewing world. Its publication is very timely, with the beer industry having had its Me Too moment in recent months, led by Brienne Allen, a brewer based in Massachusetts, US, who encouraged other women to share the stories of sexism and abuse that they've suffered in the craft beer and brewing industry. Now, this is certainly not an American problem. Here in Australia, we've recently seen a survey conducted by a group of women calling themselves the Beer Agents for Change, which found that 38% of people in the beer industry have been abused or harassed, and 90% of those people who reported that type of conduct were female. So it's in that context today that we hear from Tara about her new book. And coming up after that, you'll meet Bryony Liebig, an Australian specialising in sensory analysis and expert tasting for beer, wine and food. So Tara Nuren, thanks so much for joining us on the Drinks Adventures podcast. Thank you for having me. Really interested to find out about your new book. Tell me how it was conceived. I believe that Terry Farrendorf might have encouraged you to take this project on. You have um, either been listening in on my phone conversations or listening to my previous interviews. <laughs> Kudos either way. Um, yes, that is true. Um, Terry and I were on the phone a couple years ago, and um, she likes to use the word voluntold me. <laughs> she, uh, she said, <laughs> Tara, <laughs> she's very good at that. Um, so Terry Farendorf, as you know, founded the Pink Boots Society in 2007. And we, yeah, we should probably even clarify for some people what Pink Boots is. Right. So Pink Boots started in the United States as the only organization in the world dedicated to women in the beer industry, focusing on networking and educational opportunities. Um, It has recently grown to include women in all of the alcoholic beverage space, um, still with the same goal empowerment, education, networking. We offer a lot of scholarships, et cetera. Um, So Terry and I were on the phone and um, she said, "Uh, uh, Tara, nobody's written a book about the history of women in beer before and you need to write it. (laughs) (laughs) So she had given me some really good, very scary, big ideas in the past that I thought, oh, I don't know if I can do that. But this time I thought, well, I am a writer and a lot of people who aren't writers write books. So yes, I think I can do this. (laughs) So I did. Where does the, the book kind of begin and what's been the level of research that's been involved with it? I spent about 15 months between getting the the book contract with the publisher and submitting the manuscript. Um, I was researching before that because I needed to do a lot of research for the proposal. And um, I have been writing about women in beer for 16 or 17 years now. So I do count all of that as informal research as well. So once the official research period began, I was using work trips as jumping off points to do research. So for instance, I um, was brought over to Finland by the Finnish Tourism Bureau and I made sure to spend some time in the National Library, for instance. All of my trips the past couple of years, I've tried to do that. Every conversation I've had with or about a female in the beer space for the past, God, maybe six years now has been at least with half an eye, half an ear, Toward that, it's been, you know, a long, long, long process of research. And there's so much I couldn't include that people like to ask me, okay, well, what's your next project? Is there another Women in Beer book? And um, 
I hope so, because there's a lot more to say. The story, you know, in the history of women in beer, it sounds like it goes back all the way to, to ancient times. Maybe just sort of tell me where women in beer began. Sure. So as some of your listeners probably know, throughout most of human history, people have relied on beer and in some cases cider and in some early cases mead, what we would call mead today, um, for their daily beverage. Um, You know, in a lot of places where people lived, they either contaminated their water supply or they had believed they had contaminated their water supply, depending on where and when. Um, So there wasn't much else to drink throughout most of time. You know, soda and juice weren't being drunk. Wine was maybe not accessible or expensive. Uh, Milk wasn't something people really drank. Um, So beer it was, small beer for the kids. And so because it was part of your daily meals, it became a kitchen chore, just like cooking. And who is usually responsible for the household chores in society? Well, (laughs) it's women. So that's really how it started. There's a lot of dispute over when beer was discovered. Um, I usually say about 200,000 years ago when we were hunter-gatherers still in Africa. And um, pretty much since day one, for the reasons I said, it, it, it was women's work. This sort of subtitle for the book refers to alewives, brewsters, witches, and CEOs. Now, I definitely know what a CEO is, but tell me about these other roles that women have played over the years. Sure. So um, Brewster and alewife are both British terms um, from the Middle Ages. So, And and really, most of the time, they were one and the same. So a brewster would have been a female brewer. Um, and then an alewife would be a female brewer who sold her surplus, um, which has been very common throughout um, time and space as well. So, um, like I said, generally they were the same person, but they really do refer to two different roles. So brewer and then tavern keeper, basically. The idea of witchcraft comes up in a couple different ways throughout the book. In one way, the idea that when brewing was a matrilineal job, there was a lot of sort of intuition to it. It wasn't necessarily passed down in in books that told you to put like this much barley in and, you know, this many pounds of hops. It was, it had this sort of like close to the ground, very natural, very herbal role for people. And we're talking a lot about pagan times, you know, when people were brewing beer to worship gods and goddesses, brewing beer for harvest festivals, etc. And so there was that element of what we would call today witchcraft. Now, no thanks to, I will air quote again, progress. We have these very scientific approaches to making food and and making beverages, Um, but we have definitely lost that that element of um, making brewing part of how we express nature through ourselves as brewers. It's neat to see that there are some people, men and women, who are brewing at craft breweries who are Wiccan. And even if they don't identify as Wiccan, they do incorporate natural elements into their brewing say they might like call in the four directions or something before they start brewing, or they say some sort of incantation. And that's not something that I practice personally, but it's really gratifying to see other people doing that because it does get back to sort of this natural essence that I said that we lost when everything got so scientific. So there are only a few of them who I know of, but I'm excited to see the number of those people grow who who do bring what we would call witchcraft. Again, I want to air quote, but with, like witchcraft into their contemporary brewing. I think that's really neat. Given, you know, the role that women have had in brewing o- over so many years, and actually it sounds like it was a female-dominated craft for a long time, what went wrong? Why have we found ourselves in a situation now where brewing is so male-dominated? First of all, because this has happened over and over and over and over with 
stunning regularity. Um, and that's where, you know, that's the whole premise of the book that whether we're talking about ancient Mesopotamia or colonial America or Iron Age Finland, the same thing happened. You know, we have these women brewing as we just talked about. And then the forces of capitalism, religion, or politics, often all three at the same time, coming in and basically pushing women out, replacing them with men, often because there was a profit motive there, you know, at a certain point that, that, that was able to be realized at a certain point in the progression of said civilization. Um, so we're here because we are always here. We always get to this point. Now, if you're asking about today specifically, 2021, I unfortunately can't really speak to beer making in Australia and its history, but I can speak for the United States where, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, women were brewing in colonial America and brewing up until, you know, in some parts of the 19th century. But we had an industrial revolution here and men took over. It became scientific. People went to brewing school. Um, and then we had this fun little thing called prohibition in the 1920s here in the United States. And the people pushing for prohibition, I mean, there were men pushing for prohibition too, but it was viewed as a female campaign. And so the powerful brewing entities in the United States at that time really spent a lot of time and money to denigrate women because they knew that by punishing women who were, um, you know, struggling to, to get the vote and struggling to make alcohol illegal, that they'd be able to continue to make beer. Obviously, the brewing industry didn't want prohibition. So they really did a lot of very destructive things to the women pushing for prohibition. And then once prohibition ended, and um, we had a long period of severe consolidation in the brewing industry after that. We get the 1970s where we've really just got Bud Miller and Coors to drink. And the way that they were advertising beer for the entire middle part of the 20th century was very stereotyping to women and really marginalized them. I mean, I can't say whether that was intentional or not. You know, maybe it wasn't some vast brewing conspiracy, but the effect ended up being the same where today when there's a woman working at a brewery, they have to constantly answer questions from stupid men saying, do you actually like beer? Do you actually drink that? Do you know what you're doing? And it's kind of like, yeah, bud, we were here first. <laughs> yeah, well, I think obviously, you know, the release of your book at this time, it's had extra gravity with, you know, some of the uh, reports of some pretty horrible treatment of women that have emerged. I suppose it's an important time to be kind of shining a light on some of this history that people aren't aware of. Well, sure, because, you know, I don't know if this is happening in Australia, but I can tell you that in the United States, women are leaving the industry. Um, I probably hear about a new women, woman leaving the industry once a week or so. One of my best friends just left the industry because they're sick of it. You know, they're sick of the treatment. Look, it's, it's tough to be a working stiff these days anywhere, right? I mean, if I may, capitalism doesn't exactly work so well for, <laughs> for us humans, but, um, so women are getting really fed up and, and, and taking off, um, and why are they? And and so I'm finding that for some of the women who read the book, it has been very inspirational to them and sort of made them recommit to the profession in ways they never expected to before. Because, yeah, I mean, certainly they know, OK, women were the first brewers and, you know, they know some of the history we just went over right now. But I don't think most people really have a sense for how deep this legacy goes. And so I don't work in a brewery, um, never have, but I am being told by a lot of women who are working in breweries that this is sort of um, really made them feel some strong solidarity, both um, between past, present, and future, and also sort of geographically, more globally. They feel very much more connected now because they um, understand that none of beer wouldn't exist 
without women, probably, or at least not in the way it does now. So I, I, I am very happy when I hear that the book has been sort of very empowering and inspiring to some of these women. And, and, and the timing, like you said, did work out really nicely. Were there any particular revelations that came out of your research that you were really surprised and excited by? You know, I have had this narrative and there's this sort of common narrative that we all sort of believe here in the States about who the first female craft brewers and brewery owners were. Um, As I dug in more, I discovered some who no one no one talks about and hence the forgotten part of the book title um, because there really were women who were very instrumental in some of the earliest craft breweries here in the States who nobody knows about. And I'll give an example. Um, New Albion Brewing is the, was the first ground up craft brewery in America. It, um, opened in 1976 and unfortunately closed six years later. It was in Sonoma County, California. So people who know craft beer history know that a a Navy vet named Jack McAuliffe started New Albion. Yay. You know, everyone's very happy about that. What no one knows is that two women gave him all the money to start the brewery. And one of those women (laughs) worked there until the day they shut it down. The other woman worked there for about a year and quit. And the woman who stayed, mm, I don't talk about this a lot because my point isn't to necessarily throw shade on anyone, but um, Jack walked away and left her in more than $10,000 debt in 1982. Um, And so... And then, you know, bless his heart, Jack gets all this recognition. He gets to go on stage. He, he, you know, gets beers named after him. And nobody's even heard the names of these women. And I just think that the record needs to be righted. And so those were the exciting moments for me. Awesome. Well, well, Tara, congratulations on the book. Thanks so much for talking to us. Yeah, thank you so much. That was American beer writer Tara Neuron. As I mentioned, next up is a short interview with Bryony Liebig, who has worked as a century specialist in the beer and wine industries for some time now, most recently at the West End Brewery in Adelaide. Since West End shut down earlier this year, Bryony has focused on her own sensory consultancy called Flavor Logic. I asked Bryony how she found her way into this profession. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, sensory science was never really part of my grand career plan. I, um, I often say that I fell into sensory and it was the best thing that happened for my career. I have grown up in a winemaking family in Barossa Valley. I've got a natural uh, curiosity for the scientific world. So I got a science degree and that led to working in wine quality laboratories and a friend who was working as a a wine flavour chemist at the Australian Wine Research Institute. They made me aware of a sensory analyst position that was opening up and, yeah, I was lucky to get the job um, and on the job training with, I would say, the best wine tasters and wine scientists in Australia. And that led into a a startup business uh, where I was a sensory consultant. I got to run a expert trained panel And we did various projects for um, researchers in wine, like CSIRO and the University of Adelaide. And then you found your way into beer. Well, yes, I was in the world of research and I wanted a bit of a change. It was a network of New Zealand, Australia, sensory people. Um, At one of those conferences, I met um, Greg Organ from Lyon and um, built a connection there. And I wanted a change and a bit of industry experience. Um, And, yeah, there was an opening at West End Brewery in Adelaide for a um, sensory and lab quality person. Yeah, what was it like moving into the the brewing world and kind of learning about beer and um, and also, you know, the different sort of aspects of sensory working in a brewery? Well, I'd say the biggest difference with, with the world of wine, beer is so fast paced. Um, I learned something new every single day. In the last 10 years, I was at West End. You're making new brews every day, every week. As the sensory program leader there, um, I ran a daily tasting, 8.30 in the morning, a 
group of people would rock up and taste taste every batch in process and finished products. Um, so there was a daily clearance tasting, and then every week um, there was a, a group of trained trained tasters from the brewery, uh, from any anywhere in the brewery, not just the brewing department. Um, and yeah, they were trained to describe brand profiles. Um, so we were monitoring shelf life, um, you know, uh, indicating if certain brands were maybe premature oxidation or trialing trialing different batches. So clearance tasting and profile tasting were the two main jobs of the sensory team. And you must have at some point along that journey decided you actually liked beer because you um, <laughs> you kind of, you went on to judge beer and also, you know, become a certified Cicerone as well. Yes, yes. I think, um, yeah, sensory science and and my personality to just um, a really good match. Uh, so I've learnt that if you follow if you follow the sensory evaluation approach, you can you can learn to judge um, a variety of products. And I've um, yeah, over the years I've volunteered for cider, olive oil, wine, and beer. Um, so yeah, the sensory background helped boost my beer judging career definitely. And a few years ago, I decided to do the Cicerone, certified Cicerone, because uh, most of my career has been on the job experience. Um, so I, I just wanted, you know, a little bit of certification of, um, you know, some beer styles and knowledge. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I pursued that. And what was it like being at West End for the final moments of that brewery's unfortunate demise? Yes, it is um, it certainly an experience I'll never forget. Um, all the staff there, um, about 100 staff, um, yeah, the day we were told, we were uh, lots and lots of shocked, <laughs> lots of shocked reactions. Um, Considering the brewery had a 160-year um, birthday the year before, um, yeah, so we had nine months to to get through that as a team, um, and yeah, of course, Lion did their very best to offer support for everybody's transitions. Um, a few people were able to move into state to other breweries in the network. But I'd say the majority of people have probably actually left the beer industry. I'm one of the few that's continued on in the beer industry and I actually still live very close to the brewery and only a few months ago they, they took down all the signs yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you can see from the road. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a shame. Um, but, yeah, it was, yeah, it's very old. The, his, the history was the thing that most staff were were very were very sad about losing um, but i i know that a lot of it was donated to the state library um, and so a lot of effort was placed on on retaining some of those stories cool now tell me what is flavor logic yes well flavor logic um it was actually started about 10 years ago. I was between jobs before I knew I'd be in a beer career. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's um, consulting for the food and beverage industry um, and I've kind of rebranded and taken a fresh approach with a focus on beer after having 10 years' experience um, in that industry and, yeah, I'm hoping to boost tasting skills of anyone who wants to learn about beer um, and wine as well is in there and help boost the quality programs of, um, of breweries um, and help train hospitality industry as well. I've been running some sensory training workshops with staff and hospitality teams at, at craft breweries around South Australia. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of interest. I think the smaller breweries have all grown and grown and grown um, and getting bigger. And yeah, the, the quality space is really um, sometimes sometimes forgotten. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're I'm hoping to to just help support um, the smaller guys. 
Yeah, for sure. And people can find you online. Is it flavorlogic.com? Yes, yes. Um, new website will be launched soon. And yes, I'm on Instagram as well. Um, so yeah, you can find me there with beer education tasting tips. Awesome. Great to chat. And um, yep, hopefully we'll do it again with a beer sometime. Yeah, thank you very much. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.